First off, yeah, as Norman said, my name is Robin Stubbs. I'm from the WIT, which is the Waterford Institute of Technology. Hands up how many people actually know where that is. Oh, I'm very impressed. Normally, it's the first thing I have to explain anytime we're maybe talking at a, a conference or any kind of a symposium and so on. We're actually based down in the very southeast of Ireland. Everybody thinks of Ireland and Dublin and possibly Cork and so on, but if you think of the map of Ireland as the teddy bear, we're kind of down on the bottom right hand side of that, uh, situated very close to the coast and so on. So we, uh, we're quite lucky where we are. Uh, we have a regional focus in terms of what we actually do in uh, our, our, our department, I suppose, and within the Institute as a whole. Just to give you a bit of an overview and a bit of a context before I get into it in more detail, we're quite clear in terms of actually what an architectural technologies is in terms of how we see our graduates and so on. Very similar to Sheffield and to multiple other courses, including Plymouth and so on, we actually have an architecture program as well. And we have actually taken an approach that's probably 100% opposed <laughs> to what uh, Satish has done in Plymouth and so on. We, we actually uh, we had both programs running in 2005. We originally had architectural technology, then architecture came along. We had very grandiose ideas of merging the two. Uh, for maybe two years, we shared studio, we shared staff, we shared everything, and it proved quite disasterful. So we actually slowly began the process of actually extrapolating the two apart from each other. And that's no reflection on what they're doing in Plymouth. It actually is more a reflection of what's actually happening in Ireland at the moment in terms of building a control act. There's a, a bit of an overview context in that the architectural technology profession in Ireland is not actually recognised. If you have an honours degree in architectural technology, it's not recognised by government. It's not recognised, say, apart from CIAT, naturally enough, but it's not recognised by a lot of institutes within the country, and it's still seen, even in our local authorities or our local government offices, as a lower grade uh, industry profession. So for us to fully establish our own identity, we've actually clearly identified what we see as a professional architectural technologist. And this image that I show here is kind of the one we showed uh, first years on the very first day is to get away from that rectangular design team meeting where you have the project manager, traditionally the architect sitting at the top, and then a series of dominions sitting around the sides waiting for direction from the architect and how we're going to build that person's great masterpiece and so on. We use the round table kind of icon as what we're actually all about in that we're an equal member of the design <coughs> team who can contribute in equal fashion and in sometimes uh, be the leader of that actual design team. So we have a mission statement is to educate technologists as specialists in the science of building and to promote the profession of technologists as equal members of the design team and build team. Okay, so we were actually established, we were the first college in Ireland to actually introduce architectural technology. That was in 1978. Now they'll disagree with us in DIT and so on, but we're only talking about a series of months to actually who actually got there first and so on. And we were part of what's called an IT system which is an institute of technology, which would have been formerly a regional technical college. These were all evolved in the 70s, and their, uh, if you like, their mission statement was to react to industry and provide graduates so that they were industry ready, ready to whatever skill shortages were in the area at the time. So we've always tried to maintain relevance in the response to the industry needs. So traditionally, we would have had our T-square and Z-square. Along came CAD, and we've constantly tried to stay two steps ahead in terms of we're producing graduates that are relevant for the actual workplace. We were the first college in 2000 to introduce a four-year honours degree, and this was due in no small fact to the whole glass ceiling effect that I spoke about previously. How could we as educators tell our students coming in that you're, look, you're equal members of the design team, where if we weren't actually treating them as equals within education? So up to that point, they would have done a three-year diploma, which would be the equivalent to a HND, there thereabouts and so on. Whereas anybody doing construction, economics, construction management, architecture and so on, we're doing four-year and five-year degrees. So we actually bought in a four-year honours degree programme in 2000. It was the first in the country and it was, the it was the only one in the country for maybe six, seven years. And it elevated, if you like, our graduates to that level. It removed the glass ceiling in terms of our graduates trying to actually develop on, further their education and actually, you know, go on and study masters, postgraduates. And it was a another step on this journey, if you like, to becoming the equal member of the design team. So what is BIM? I'm pretty sure everybody, I hope, at this point in the audience, especially for a construction-related uh, symposium, realizes what BIM is. There's a lot of students actually have noticed have joined us. One. Does everybody know what BIM is at this point? Yeah? No? We'll, we'll presume you have a, a working knowledge of BIM. Essentially, BIM is a collaborative process. And the way we describe it to 
say, parents on open days and so on, is that we build the building virtually prior to building it for real. And the, I suppose the analogy we give is the Formula One industry. You know, you think of the amount of testing that a Formula One car goes through before it's actually put on the track for Lewis Hamilton or Kimi Reckoning or anyone to actually sit in and start driving it. We don't do that with buildings, you know. We haven't done traditionally. People alluded to a pre, uh, in this morning's seminar where we we're talking about the amount of wastage in the building industry. Studies by McGraw and Hill and so on stipulate that it could be up to a 20% saving with BIM. It's not money that you get back, it's the money you don't spend on variations. Because you've built, if you like, your proposed design in a virtual world, you've tested it, and then once you've uh, ironed out all the mistakes, then you start to, to actually build on site. And we have this saying, or it's, uh, it's often quoted, that performance-based architecture is going to be the new aesthetic. You know, in that we have to actually stress test our buildings prior to actually putting them on site. Otherwise, have we evolved at all from 20, 30, even 10 years ago and so on. So we decided BIM, and in the context of actually what's happening, everybody's pretty sure uh, are aware of UK Level 2 coming in in 2016 in April for the initial rollout for all projects and so on, government funding. We're following suit in Ireland. Uh, 2018 is the kind of initial date that's flagged. More than likely, it'll be 2020. But a lot of our graduates will actually go to companies that are working here in the UK, the likes of the bigger contractors like BAM and so on, and they require these BIM skills. So we've seen the maturity grant or the maturity graph again that's been supported by all the PaaS documents and the BIM protocol and so on. We actually use this as a blueprint in terms of preparing our students so that they're BIM ready. Now we talk about BIM, and I said that BIM is a process, but there's also BIM technologies to it as well. One thing that we did introduce as part of our integration with BIM into our architecture technology program was the virtual studio. Can anybody recognize these buildings here? They're all done by the one architect. Okay, so they're done by Frank Gehry. The building on the left was a, an apartment block that was proposed nearly 15 years ago at this stage between Frank Gehry and his company, uh, Gehry Technologies, where he actually wanted to construct the first building without using paper. He didn't have the technology at the time to complete the task. However, the new Louis Vuitton building in Paris, which was recently completed, was the first building constructed on the cloud. Now, I've heard conflicting stories and so on, There's, and there always is, but this is the one that's received the most notoriety, is the first, if you like, true BIM building. <coughs> what does that actually mean? Well, it means that the subcontractor arriving on site, everybody involved in that project, have to operate in this virtual cloud, this common data environment where there was one building model that all the professions, all the design team, all the subcontractors were actually using, and it was confederated. What that means is that essentially everybody put their input into this one space, and then it could be cross-interrogated by multiple users. So it eliminated all element of risk to a large degree. And the savings on the project, you know, there's umpteen papers written about it at this stage, it ranges from anywhere between 12 and 22% in savings and costs and so on. What's very interesting about this building is it's not your standard three bed semi D, semi D house uh, in a housing estate. This is actually like, you know, a true Frank Gehry building, organic in nature, innovative materials and so on and so forth. So if this is the industry our students are going to, surely we should be preparing for that. Now, our goal as a, at all times is to ensure that our students or our graduates are industry ready. You know, they're not the finished article by any means. You know, they're, they're ready to go into industry and actually contribute. Allied to this, we did a, a survey with the students prior to introducing it, and we asked them several questions. The biggest, uh, the biggest feedback that was kind of shocking to us was the amount of money students spend on printing every year. <laughs> Ranges between 250 euro to 350 euro, with some students recording nearly up to 500 euro for crits and so on. Uh, deadlines, in terms of actually getting that printing done, they always had to finish their project a day earlier because they couldn't complete it on time because there was a queue for their printer. Everybody's heard the stories before. The printer ran out of ink, we ran out of paper and so on. And stress as well. A lot of guys would actually say, you know, you're, it was a lottery in terms of whether you actually get your project handed up in time because you were, you're trying to gauge the queue to the printers and so on like that. Also as well, if there are any students in the room, and I don't mean this in a patronizing way, the majority of students coming into our programs now are the PlayStation generation. They live in the virtual world. Even Sam here tweeting earlier on, so on shows, it's never too old. You know, everyone has a smartphone, everyone has a tablet. As recently over the Halloween break, I was up at a science museum with my two-year-old son and four-year-old daughter, and uh, it was one of these kids' museums, 
and in the corner there was a, a PC very similar to this with a, a house building program on it for kids where you literally go use a mouse and you pick up the digger and you bring over and you drop in your house and so on so I brought over Harry the two year old to have a look at it he picked up the mouse didn't know what it was you know, he threw it at the screen he started touching the screen and trying to move the digger along and so on because he's more used to actually working in tablets and so on now not that my children spend all their time on uh, <laughs> smartphones and tablets and so on but it just shows like if that's the sensitivity of a two-year-old in terms of embracing technology why are we bringing in students at 17 to 19 years of age telling them to stop all that ignore all these technologies till you get out into the industry again instead of actually embracing it and working with it and so on so there's that dynamic so how does it actually work we say paperless but it's paperless in terms of production it's not necessarily paperless uh, in terms of a tool. We still believe that pencil and paper, the sketch, the roll of sketch paper and the pencil and so on, are happy bedfellows with say our BIM ethos or our BIM philosophy. So they still sketch details out on butter paper. We still stick things on walls for quick kind of uh, markups and so on like that as well. And then we work in conjunction with our simulation tools. We gave ourselves a few guidelines. We said first off, had to be free, free to the students. So I know you're going to see a lot of logos and badges there and so on. But all these logos and badges are free to students in Ireland and I'm sure in the UK and further afield as well. We use Dropbox as our common data environment in line with PAS 1192-2. Our BIM authoring tool of choice is Revit. Our BIM simulation tools is uh, Design Studio, Vasari, Deep, so on. Our editing tools, and this is where, believe it or not, where it kind of fell down slightly, was actually not so much with the students, but it was with the staff and actually getting them to come along to the party as well in terms of how we actually interact with the students. So just like a classroom scenario like this, you've all been at a crit, uh, say it's an interim crit, there's 40 in the room, the first two people hand up their drawings in the wall, the three studio lecturers sit around with big red pens, mark it all up, everybody huddles around, what's happening there, what's happening there, no one can see it. By the time it's the third student, unless you're the next person to be critted, you're usually down the back of the room or outside for a bit of fresh air or down for a cup of coffee and you lose interest. The way we actually do it now is uh, we do it through tablets. So instead of handing up drawings to hand up PDFs on their sheets, we put it up on a large screen, maybe twice the size of that, where the, st the studio tutor will interact with their tablet, which is linked to the screen, and mark up the drawings as everybody's looking at it. Everybody gets the comment. If it's done through A360, everyone can actually mark up the drawings as we're going back and forth. It keeps everybody involved and everybody's intuitively engaged with the process. And it's a lot, shall we say, harder for the students to slip away and disengage from the whole process. But we've also supported, or we've also kind of spread it out a bit as well. We realize that this is, as I said, the PlayStation generation. They're more adept at these technologies than we really are. So uh, one slot every Thursday morning, we do a little tech slot and we ask them to come back to us with apps that are better than the ones that we're using. The only proviso is that they have to be free. So they go and they scour the internet and they find different things and they come back and we might trial them out. Some will work, some won't. You know, things are being constantly upgraded. And it gives them a bit of ownership then in the process as well. And it's all about this collaborative workspace, which if you like BIM is and so on. So how does it actually work in real? Like, is it just simply 3D networking or are you just using 3D models and so on? Where is the actual BIM element into it? We were semesterized there several years ago as well. And what we found, similar to uh, Satish was talking about as well, things changed. You know, we went from having this fantastic 16 week long term to down to 12 teaching weeks. We only had two of them. I think in the first year we lost eight weeks or something like that. We went from one to the other. We're supposed to teach exactly the same things, but just in a much more economical or efficient manner. Not necessarily that easy, especially when you want to achieve the outcomes of a level eight course. So we're Similar to the QQA, we're going through the QQI in Ireland, and we've actually established what those learning outcomes should be. So for us to achieve that, it's not possible to do it in the framework that we actually had. And for this to be truly BIM, we had to look at integration. So I would argue that previously we were overassessing our students, you know, and they're all working in these small little silos. And this is the BIM terminology you hear all the time, that we have all design professionals working in individual silos, not talking to each other until they arrive on site. And we were actually doing that in education. You think about it, who here is as a year leader and knows what the guy in history is doing? All you care about is that you get your CAs in off them and the results in for the course board. So we said, oh, we have to stop that. We said we have to be a bit more efficient. It's going to have to be quality over quantity. So what we do now is we use Studio, if you like, as our confederated model or our, uh, you like, our core element, and then all the other modules have to feed into that. So that gives us a lot of scope to overlap credits 
use the same building if you like for assessment just different grading criteria and so on like that as well but it allows us to be more efficient with our time and the students time so this is just a simple project or sorry an example of a project that we've actually applied it on this is for a, a train station re retrofit in Waterford where we used we try sorry I should say as well we try and work with our partners all the time when we're doing our projects in our, in our programs and so on so this time we worked with Irish Rail worked with the local authority and with a few other stakeholders involved five minutes left okay okay so to apply this we use studio as the, uh, the main element and then we bring in the other modules and the students had to redesign uh, the train station so it was just more than a train station we have an awful thing in Ireland about train stations they're exactly the way they were in the 1970s in that trains come in and trains go out whereas if you walk around anywhere here even around London obviously is a great example you know there's a cinema attached to it there's a hotel on top there's a huge commercial centre or activity around it there might be even a swimming pool or something like that close by as well in Ireland that uh, outside of Dublin to be fair uh, that hasn't really happened and we've a lot of these old decrepit uh, railway stations from the 1930s and so on so Waterford is a prime example so they had to reimagine the train station as more than a train station it had to have a social impact on the city and act as an economic driver all very aspirational for a lot of fourth year students but you have to aim high so the guys redesigned uh, the building and we actually applied our BIM technologies and just to show the students that it wasn't just uh, apologies for the music right because uh, oh yeah I thought they asked you with that. I just turned into music. That music from a, a team song from a, an Irish soap opera. Uh, <laughs> you may have heard of it. <laughs> Fair City. <laughs> The reason why we, I use this is because uh, if I just bring it on, this is probably the winning solution and so on, and uh, you might see it in the award ceremony coming up next year, please God. Because uh, we entered into an international competition, and it was all about, actually, it was called the CETA Smart Collaboration Process. We're up against five other institutes uh, from all over uh, Europe, Slovenia, so on. We didn't win. We were robbed, as they say, and so on. But part of uh, our, our uh, submission was that we want to show how BIM invites in the public and uh, to give a better understanding of how the uh, the building will perform how the building will look and so on so as part of that project we set up we just did a kind of a what we call a, a gorilla presentation we took down a, on our ground floor there's a privately owned restaurant and they have this lovely little alcove in around the back of the lift shaft and every so often we just put up a display down there and so on not asking anybody we just do it and this is one of those afternoons where we set up six stations and we use different BIM technologies for each station so uh, station one was 2D plans and section Section 2 was a point cloud and survey, 3 was Navisworks, 4 3D Max, 5 Infraworks and 6 was the Oculus Rift. And we did a quick survey of the 80 people that went through it from the public, asking them their level of understanding of the different stages. And to a fault, they all approached it the same way. Everybody will say that they can understand what a 2D drawing is, the member of the public. Of course I understand that, I see grand designs, I see this, I see that. Of course I understand what you're trying to propose there. By the time they went through the different stages and experienced the different elements, they all go back and change their first one and say, oh shit. They all go back, and this is just a bit of footage from today, the they all go back and actually change their grades again because they didn't actually understand the plans and elevations or the sections and so on. The more they became immersed with the BIM technologies that was actually happening there, the more they actually understood the building. And we believe not only would this allow for savings in the construction, but it would also allow for savings in time of project uh, running and so on. Less objections, people have a better understanding prior to the event. So it's not just all, as my colleagues like to say, fur coat. There is a bit of substance to it. You know, we do talk about the Ds of BIM. They're integrated through the modules and so on. So there's an element of value management to it. There's an element of uh, energy analysis. There's an element of the 3D and so on. And this is brought into those, if you like, uh, supporting modules. We're kind of the only guys within our department actually doing it uh, at the moment. So our idea would be to have BIM workshops at other courses from within the School of Engineering all to join in and help us out at the moment they're not quite up to the same speed where we are with the technologies so we organize these workshops where we get everyone into a room for a day we take one aspect of the project and then we'll try and brainstorm it and so on in a real kind of true BIM workshop getting guest speakers and previous uh, graduates who are now actually working say as BIM managers or BIM coordinators in larger companies just to show as well, we have industrial placement where we actually send the guys out, but they have to go to a BIM-orientated office. 
and then they have to do their BIM implementation plan on the live project actually when they return into the course and so on. And this kind of, uh, uh, this is the last slide, Norman, before I know I'm running over, <laughs> before I get hauled off. This is uh, something we were talking about this morning in the programs, uh, the approved program leaders meeting and so on, or, uh, where we're actually talking about the different programs and how we're saying how it's so diverse at the moment, you know, where our graduates go. And that we kind of touch on everything without really getting into the nitty gritty. And Sam was kind of leading a debate on detailed design and so on like that as well. And, and I agree, you know, they have to develop the tools. You're not going to be an expert in every aspect, say, of BIM in our case, or of uh, maybe sustainability, might be building conservation and so on. But what we insist that they do is their final semester. They do their final keystone project in semester seven, which is up to Christmas. They just finished now. They then have to take one aspect of that, and then they have to do a 12,000 word research paper or dissertation on that aspect, where they really have to mine in to the minutiae and mine that data out of that topic. We're not so really concerned actually about the topic, to be brutally honest. It's more about the methodology and how they actually do it. Teaching them the difference between qualitative and quantitative, comparative analysis, critical analysis, and give them that tool set, if you like, so when they do go on, they have that ability. Okay, and where we're going from here, Norman alluded to uh, earlier, we're part of the BIM Research Group, myself, Gordon, and another colleague set it up. We do a lot of work with industry. It starts off as the kind of innovation voucher thing, but it grows into consultancy and so on. And then to date, we probably have about maybe 40, 50 companies we're actively working with over the last two years and so on. And this is an important part, maybe for CIUT as well, is that we haven't forgotten the guys who graduated five years ago. Because uh, was it two years, you said, was the lifetime for uh, computer science? I think it's something similar in architecture related programs as well, or technology. It moves so fast. So we do a series of springboards slash CBD slash higher diploma postgraduate courses that are there for our ex-graduates to come back within four or five and we offer them on a part-time basis so the one we're running at the moment is quite popular is a higher diploma in BIM so the guys who graduated five years ago they realize this whole BIM thing is happening they're not getting work because of it they can come back into us and we have this we like to think a kind of a lifelong relationship with the graduate and so on like that all right I'm not too far over am I? <laughs> we got it there.